Hi, this is Ashley. Today we are covering examiner favorites on the brachial plexus for anatomy spot exams and oral finals. Since this is a very short session, we won't be spending time on basic definitions. You should already have a general idea of what the brachial plexus is. This is more of a must know and review video. I won't be spending time on all the nerves. My goal is to give you an idea of what might be asked and some popular questions from examiners. Roots, trunks, divisions, cords, and branches. This sequence is the foundation for everything else. So roots of the brachial plexus is from C5 to T1, and remember that C8 exists. These then combine to form the three trunks in the posterior triangle of the neck. There's superior, middle, and inferior. Knowing which roots form which trunk is crucial, especially for the clinical correlations. For the superior trunk, it's formed by C5 and C6. The middle trunk is a continuation of C7, and the inferior trunk is formed by C8 and T1. The long thoracic nerve of Bell is from the roots C5, 6, and 7. Damage of the long thoracic nerve, you'll see winging of the scapula. Herb's palsy is a high-yield superior trunk injury presenting as the waiter's tip position, and Klumpke's palsy is an inferior trunk injury. It gives you the distinctive claw hand deformity. Examiners can ask you on these. Behind the clavicle, each trunk divides into anterior and posterior divisions. These six divisions then rearrange in the axilla to form the three cords, named for their position relative to the axillary artery. There's lateral, medial, and posterior. Out of these three, posterior loves to be asked, but you should really know all three. The posterior cord mnemonic is STARS. You should know that it consists of the upper subscapular nerve, thoracal dorsal nerve, axillary nerve, radial nerve, and lower subscapular nerve. These are the big five major terminal branches of the brachial plexus. For each of these nerves, you absolutely must know their cord origin, the muscles they innervate, their sensory distribution, and their classic injury presentations. So an examiner can definitely point out a muscle and ask you its nerve supply, and then ask you what might happen if it's damaged, or they can describe a sensory loss and ask for the affected nerve. So first up, the musculocutaneous nerve. Remember its origin from the lateral cord. It innervates the muscles of the anterior compartment of the arm, most notably the biceps brachii. So if you get a question about weakened elbow flexion or forearm supination, think musculocutaneous. The injury will also cause sensory loss on the lateral forearm. The axillary nerve is from the posterior cord, and it's a common injury site. Fractures of the surgical neck of the humerus or shoulder dislocations are classic causes. You should look for impaired shoulder abduction due to deltoid atrophy. And remember the distinctive regimental badge, sensory area over the shoulder. This is really important. The radial nerve is the largest branch of the posterior cord and controls all your extensors in the arm and forearm. Its most famous injury presentation is wrist drop, where the patient cannot extend their wrist or fingers. Common causes include mid shaft humeral fractures or compression injuries like Saturday night palsy. The median nerve is unique as it is formed by both the lateral and medial cords. It's famously involved in carpal tunnel syndrome at the wrist, leading to sensory loss in the lateral hand and the classic ape hand deformity. For higher injuries, examiners love to ask about the hand of benediction or median claw when a patient tries to make a fist. And finally, the ulnar nerve is originated from the medial cord, and injuries can often occur at the elbow, giving you funny bone, so that funny bone sensation, or at the wrist, um, and the classic deformity is the ulnar claw, affecting the pinky and ring fingers, and significantly impacting fine motor control of the hand, so... This is because of intrinsic hand muscle dysfunction. And also, don't overlook important preterminal branches as they frequently pop up as well. 
So there is the dorsal scapular nerve and it controls your rhomboids and it's important for scapular retraction and the suprascapular nerve is vital for the rotator cuff muscles and the supraspinatus and infraspinatus which are critical for shoulder movement and you should know these muscles and their actions. Remember for anatomy finals, especially oral exams, at least it's often a quick two-on-one situation with my examiners and there are lots of students so we just speed through questions in our designated time slots. Usually there are two or three general brachial plexus questions depending on your examiners but be prepared for lots of questions on the terminal nerve branches as they relate heavily on muscles, sensory innervation, and clinical injuries, you don't need to know specifically all the pre-terminal branches and their exact origins from the plexus for your finals, but definitely know the individual nerves. And if you can't answer a question in a spot exam, they'll often move to another. So don't stress too much about getting every single detail perfect, but absolutely nail these core concepts and clinical applications. Review your notes and practice tracing these pathways and quiz yourself on these injury presentations. Good luck with your final exams and you're going to crush it.